So this episode is from an interview I had about the project that I'm leading called Equals EU. Equals EU is a project funded by the European Commission. It kicked off last year, so we're in the middle of the project. We got a lot of exciting things coming up. If you could tell me just in a, in a nutshell, what do you think is the most important? What are the key messages? Uh, for me, the, the main issue that we're trying to tackle with Equals EU is to create more gender inclusive uh, innovation ecosystems. So that's basically looking at cities and neighborhoods that are trying to become more innovation focused and making sure that whether it's an event or just the institutional culture, that that is uh, focused on ensuring that women have a safe place to gather, women have a safe place to contribute and are valued and prioritized in that work. Uh, so that's a kind of an abstract way of thinking about it. One of the areas that we're really drilling down to that we want to ensure that uh, is an output of the project is to elevate future leaders in this space. So the whole project is oriented around grassroots mobility. So that means tapping into local uh, individuals and communities and ensuring they have opportunities and the resources necessary to take their ideas to the next level. And so that means both commercializing, implementing, but also gaining the skills and knowledge that they need to become future leaders in this field. I mean, one of the areas of research that we conducted recently in cooperation with GSMA and uh, funded by Ernst & Young, EY, was looking at self-perceptions of leadership and the differences between men and women. Because one thing we do know is that there's a leadership gap, right? So men tend to uh, uh, be elevated into positions of leadership uh, and women tend um, to hit that glass ceiling. And so we wanted to understand a bit more about how individuals experience their own leadership styles. And one of the things we found was that women actually have more visionary ideas around how they lead teams. Uh, we found that women have a much stronger focus on uh, mentorship and kind of raising the, uh, the, the floor for all the people that they work with. And so these are a couple of key characteristics that are indicative, we believe, of a larger uh, leadership style that women tend to evoke, or at least women see themselves as having evoked. And I think this is a really important way of looking at the work that we're doing because we're not trying to necessarily uh, fix the imbalance in a way that is uh, creating a deficit. We're actually enhancing an organization's opportunities by taking the talent that's already embedded there but is somehow limited by organizational, what we already mentioned, organizational cu culture. Uh, procedures are often uh, established in a way that uh, is biased against women. So let's just take an example. The way we write job descriptions is often written in a way that discourages women from applying and encourages men because men see the job description, they see themselves in that job description, and often women aren't able to see themselves in the same way. And so it's important to look at the details when we're talking about the barriers that women experience and everything from leadership to opportunities to uh, go into STEM fields, opportunities to own their own businesses. Um, and I mean, we all know about the harassment culture. We all know about hate speech, on, hate speech online that affects women and their opportunities. Um, but we don't have a lot of solutions yet. And so one of the things the project's just trying to tackle is to understand what are the mechanisms that we can use to enable and empower more women to come into these positions. The way organizations perceive these candidates is really critical because in almost all instances, because of the way we've constructed society, because of the priority we put on gender and race in certain respects, especially white men will be given the benefit of the doubt of either being able to learn it on the job or having already known something that they may not have a firm grasp on or firm experience with. Uh, so that's just one thing I want to point out. The other thing is uh, non-traditional career paths. So a lot of times women might have a gap in their CV because they've had a child and they want to uh, care for that child for some time. And, uh, and recruiters may look at that as a deficit in their professional uh, profile because they're seeing, oh, there's a career gap here. They might not have the same level of expertise as someone who didn't have that career gap. And this automatically, kind of by definition, disadvantages women uh, to a greater extent than men. 
And so I think we need to reorient our way of approaching the hiring process and think more critically about the ways in which people come into an industry and that that's not necessarily, their their past experience doesn't necessarily dictate their ability to perform the functions and even exceed the responsibilities in the job. And that gets into the whole issue of how we undervalue uh, childcare uh, and how we undervalue a person's contribution to society and the way they learn in, uh, in, in more informal uh, situations, more uh, home-based situations. It really has been a, a lot of uh, support coming from all areas. And of course, a lot of this is coming from the places you would expect it to come from, you know, advocates, young people who are, you know, wanting to champion this kind of work and get involved in this kind of work. I think there's a big generational divide here around who wants to uh, move into this space. And I find that uh, amongst uh, the younger generations, we're talking about millennials and Gen Z, you know, they're ready to take this fight on and make it their life's work. And I find so much respect and admiration in that. Um, and that's not to say that there's not also uh, emphasis and priority and, and energy coming from the older generations. It's only to say that I think the future is really, really bright. And I think what we're seeing right now is an acceleration of this work and these efforts. Now, the hope is always that the acceleration doesn't lose sight of the impact that we don't just become a lot of talking heads who like to think big thoughts and say big words, but then there's no substance to it. So I think the, uh, the, the hope is that the integrity uh, behind these movements remains and that the next mm -hmm. generation just continues to champion this work in a, in a real and uh, formidable way. And it, it does bring us to this issue of evidence-based decision-making and the data gaps that we do find. So one of the areas that I've been lucky enough to participate in is uh, part of the Equals Global Network. So Equals EU is kind of a um, uh, under a larger scale operation that's led by, uh, for example, the UN's uh, International Telecommunications Union and uh, again, GSMA and a lot of other really amazing partners. And so one of the things that we've uh, kind of led in that effort is understanding the data gaps in access to technology in Africa amongst men and women. Fundamental knowledge like that, we just don't always have access to, and we don't even know where the gaps are necessarily. And so being right. able to create a sort of knowledge infrastructure where we're very clear on what the problem is, is the only way we can then advance into trying to identify and implement solutions. And I think Ayana's work is gonna be a critical factor in that because she's really looking at a life course perspective across a number of different uh, generations, and location so we get the contextual element to it all and looking at where those kind of pivot points exist where women might uh, move away from innovation, entrepreneurship, technology development or where women might move into those fields. So this year, we've already kicked off a series of 24 innovation camps and hackathons in 24 different countries. And we're really excited because the whole thing, that part of the project is going to wrap up around June. And the people who have participated in those events are going to move on into an incubator program. And this is a custom incubator program really explicitly focused on the gendered aspects of entrepreneurship. So we're going to take those individuals, we're going to take them as teams through this incubator program to help them develop their ideas, to help them commercialize them where it's appropriate, and to give them the mentorship and support that they need to be successful. Once they complete that at the end of the year, we're going to move into the third phase of the project, which is the most exciting part for me, because we're going to take the leaders from each of these teams and we're going to fly them to three different universities across Europe. We're going to be taking them to Kharkiv, Ukraine, and the National University of Internal Affairs. We're going to be running them through a one-week boot camp there. Then they're going to be all going to Geneva, Switzerland, where they're going to be at the Graduate Institute and work with some of our partners at the ITU, the UN ITU, and CERN, and get another uh, week-long boot camp. And finally, they're going to wrap the whole thing up in Valencia, Spain, at the University of Valencia, where they'll have the final week of the boot camp, and they'll, on the last day, 
pitch their ideas for the future of gender-inclusive innovation to a group of uh, investors from the United States, from Norway, and from the African Development Bank. So it's an absolute critical opportunity to, again, raise and elevate the profiles of these grassroots advocates, uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, troublemakers. I like to think of them all as troublemakers because we're trying to upset the status quo.